First, let's talk a little bit about deep dropping, and then we'll get into Bimini and the Bahamas. Who likes deep dropping? Okay. The people who didn't raise your hand, I'm wondering what the hell you're doing here. All right. I mean, what are you doing here? Because free beer. <laughs> taco. Okay. All right. That settles it. Free beer and tacos makes perfect sense. All along, I thought it was for me too. Damn. Okay. Anyhow. Deep dropping, you know, there's a big misconception as far as I'm concerned. There's a lot of people who don't enjoy deep dropping or think it's unsporty because you're using, oftentimes you're using electric tackle, right? You know, electric reels, and they think it's unsporty. I say hogwash, you know, I think it's incredibly sporty because A, you've got to find the fish, you've got to rig properly, you've got to apply the techniques properly, and really electric reels, as far as I'm concerned, it's a tool. You know, there's guys that go out there and go kite fishing and use electric reels because it's a tool. There's guys that go out there and use electric down riggers, and we do all of that. And there's certainly a time and a place for electric reels. And we're going to be talking about that tonight. Everything that we're talking about is going to be with electric reels. Understand that you can do this with manual equipment as well. Okay. However, I'm just curious, if you're fishing a spot that's 1,200 feet deep, okay, and you're fishing a 10-pound sash weight, and you drop that down, and you're in two knots of current, and you hook, I don't know, a 20-pound grouper, and you reel it up. How many times do you think you can do that in one day? Okay, you, you'll be lucky if you can do it once in one day, right? So there's a time and a place, but like I said, you certainly can do this with manual equipment, especially on the shallower side, because nowadays there's a whole trend with fishing, and that trend is smaller, lighter, stronger. Okay, we now have braid. That is, that has changed the game, right? It's certainly nothing new. We've all been fishing braid for years, and when it comes to deep dropping, it's absolutely vital. You know, do not even attempt to deep drop fish without braid. Okay, and now there's a whole new generation of line called PE line, which is even thinner and rounder than your typical braid. Does that make a difference? Absolutely it makes a difference. It reduces the friction and allows us again to scale down our tackle. So technology, advancements in equipment have allowed you know, anglers to reach depths that they never could before. And like I said, you can do it manually. But for the sake of this seminar and for the sake of efficiency and productivity on a consistent basis, it's all about electric tackle. It's all about electric reels. Another thing that's really exciting about deep dropping, anybody can do it. You don't have to be the super expert, super duper marlin fisherman or whatever. You've got to know how to bait a hook. Who knows how to bait a hook? Okay, and you don't even have to do it well. Just put the stinky bait on the hook, as long as it's on that hook. You don't even have to hide the hook, okay? And there's a lot of hooks, so if you miss a fish, that's okay, because you've got other chances. And you drop it to the bottom. You just pull back a little lever, so anybody can do it, okay? But of course, not everybody's gonna go out there and consistently be successful. You've gotta be dialed in. You've gotta be dialed in with the right tackle, where you're fishing, how you're doing it, so on and so forth. So anybody can do it. Another cool thing about it is the variety, the variety of fish that you can catch deep dropping, especially over in the Bahamas. You know, we've got vermilion snapper that you'll catch over there. You'll catch ham bone snapper, which are also known as black fin snapper. You'll catch black snapper, which is a completely different type of snapper. Silky snapper. Of course, you'll catch the, the prized Okay, the prized queen snapper. Everybody loves to catch queen snapper. Everybody goes crazy over queen snapper. By the way, this is a fiberglass release mount from King Sailfish. So if you want to get a beautiful fish mounted, make sure to check out King Sailfish. They're local in the area, and they put together the, the really the finest release mounts. But anyhow, it's enough for them. Um, again, a prized queen snapper. This is what everybody looks for when they go to the Bahamas. And then, of course, groupers. Right? We always have an opportunity at grouper. And what's the most popular grouper in deep water in the Bahamas? Okay. Snowy or mystic? Mystic? Somebody tell me again. Snowy? Snow. Oh, no. Red 
Every, no, he's right, with mystic. Everybody calls a mystic grouper, but guess what? It's not a mystic grouper. It's a misty grouper. Misty, <coughs> not mystic, okay? It's a common error that everybody makes, so don't feel bad. Okay? Again, I've even made it on TV. I'm like, mystic! I'm like, it's not a mystic, it's a misty. Okay. Nevertheless, you know, that is the most common grouper. There's also wreckfish. You know, so there's a lot of different species that you could catch deep dropping. That's another benefit to deep drop fishing. So it's, it's relatively easy. Anybody can do it with any experience, with any skill level. Um, you catch a wide variety of fish. And what's the commonality across all of those different species that you catch? Thank you. Woo! Woo! They're all delicious. You are meat fishing. That's what this is about. And understand, too, it's not, you know, there are certainly a lot more sporty fisheries than deep dropping. When I say sporty, you know, taking a 10-pound test spinner and throwing a bait at a 20-pound dolphin is pretty sporty, right? And, you know, you're one-on-one. -on -one. So whereas using the electric tackle may not be as sporty, but again, in those depths and in that venue that we're fishing, it's really the only gear that you could effectively do this with. So we've got the variety, okay? What's another benefit to deep drop fishing is you can do it all day long, okay? You can do it at any time of the day, and oftentimes the best bite is later in the day. In other words, you don't have to get up at the crack of dawn, and when you're over in the Bahamas, who gets up at the crack of dawn to go fishing when you're in the Bahamas, okay? Not very many people because you're always out the night before, you know, saucing it up a little bit, so you tend to sleep late, and that's okay, because you can go deep dropping later in the morning, and it can still be very effective. Like I said, the higher that sun is in the sky, they tend to bite better. Also, the clearer the weather, blue skies versus cloudy overcast conditions, you're gonna find that those blue sky days, those bluebird days are gonna be more effective than the cloudy days. Even when you're fishing really deep water from 800 feet and greater, and you may think, well, it's almost pitch black down there. If not pitch black, how do they know? They know. Okay, they know. I don't know how they know, but I promise you they know. Okay, because it's just across the board. Like I said, the clearer it is, the more effective deep dropping tends to be. It's also a great plan B, meaning if you go out there and you go trolling for dolphin, or you go jigging, or you go high-speed wahoo fishing, or you go tuna fishing in the channel, and you're unsuccessful, or you are successful, either way, and you want to switch it up and do something else, it's deep dropping. Never, never go to the, to go to the Bahamas without having some deep drop tackle, because oftentimes, who here has been to Bimini, or anywhere in the Bahamas deep dropping? Okay, how many times has deep dropping saved your trip? <laughs> a bunch. Right, a bunch. In other words, you go over there and plan A, whatever that was, didn't work out, and then your deep drop tackle, you were able to put some meat, you know, some fish in the boat, and that changed the game altogether. You know, it really does, especially when you can catch some really big fish. Those misty grouper, how big can those grouper get? 40. Big, 40, 50 pounds, 100 pounds. Okay, there are wreck fish that are well over 100 pounds. There's some fish that you'll hook on the bottom that you just can't stop. You literally just can't get them off the bottom. They're just too big. They'll straighten hooks. They'll bust leaders. You know, there's, there's sea monsters that live on the bottom there. They're really, really hard. So again, you're not only talking about catching small fish, you're talking about a wide variety of fish and a lot of quality fish as well. So, now let's talk a little bit about Bimini and the Bahamas in general. Heading over to Bimini, remember that from Hillsborough Inlet, and I'll just use that as a reference because of course it's our home port, you're like 53 miles, okay? It's not very far, you know? And a lot of people who have not made the run over to, Bimini's or, or to Bimini are often concerned because they're like, man, I'm running 50 something miles out into the middle of the ocean. No, you're not, you're running 25 miles out in the middle of the ocean, and then there's another 25 miles to get to Bimini on the other side of the Gulf Stream. Okay, so you're really never 50 miles out in the middle of the ocean. And truthfully, when you run over to Bimini, you can see the high-rise buildings and the skyline off Miami for the first 15 to 18 miles. And then you might go maybe 20 miles before you start to see Bimini and the islands on the other side of the stream. 
So you're really not out of sight of land if you're concerned with that. And some people are. I've talked to a lot of people, believe it or not. There's a young lady in the back of the room going, yep, yep, I want to see land. Okay, I want to, I'll go anywhere, but I want to see land. Is that what you're saying? And I don't blame you. Okay, absolutely. Sure, you know, because people associate land with safety, right? They do. They're like, as long as I can see land, I'm good. And I'm like, well, what the hell's the difference if you're 10 miles off the beach or if you're 110 miles off the beach? You're not swimming, okay? So it'd probably be more agonizing to know land is right there. But nevertheless, it's, it's easy. It's not that far. And there's always boats that are crossing over to the island so you could go with a buddy boat. You can meet these people at fishing seminars like this right here. Guys are always looking to cross over. Or I assure you, almost every single weekend, there are boats that are crossing over to Bimini, weather permitting. As Marshall said, all the hotels are free this weekend. Um, nevertheless, you know, you could sit right outside Hillsborough Inlet and you'll, you could easily tell who's running to the islands and you can just simply say, hey, would you mind if I ran over with you? You know, Facebook, social networks, you know, it's easier nowadays, easier than it's ever been to connect with other anglers, right? You know, it used to be where you had to pick up the phone or whatever, a member of a fishing club. Now everything's at your fingertips with social networks. And again, it's very easy to connect with other boats that are crossing over. Safety, though, regardless of how close, has to be a top priority because the truth of the matter is you are out in the middle of the ocean and you are dealing with the Gulf Stream current that's raging at three to five knots, right? So remember that. Something happens, you're not sitting in one spot. You're moving it upwards of five miles an hour, you know, regardless if, God forbid, somebody falls in the water, if something happens to the boat. And listen, accidents happen. That's the truth of the matter. There was recently a case, you know, that we all saw in the news of two firefighters, ex-military. These guys, if anybody could survive, you would think it would be these guys. And unfortunately, never found a trace of them. How does that happen? How did, you know, how does a boat completely vanish and literally just vanish? Then you have the Coast Guard and so many resources out there looking for them and all they find is a tackle bag. You know, I don't understand how that happens. But nevertheless, that's why it's called an accident. And it happens. Plus, the ride over to Bimini, I'm not sure if you know this, but it's in the Bermuda Triangle. Okay? <laughs> it's in the Bermuda Triangle. So things happen in the Bermuda Triangle, right, that are unexplainable. So safety has to be a top concern. Fuel, make sure that you run over with as much fuel as you can possibly carry because right now i was just talking to somebody about it fuel locally on the water is like two dollars and fifty cents a gallon it's more affordable rec 90 right now than it's ever been before fuel over in bimini 550 a gallon okay talk about getting raped excuse me but all right 250 a gallon here and 550 a gallon there however the price isn't the biggest problem. The availability is a huge problem. Sometimes you're there, they don't have fuel. Okay, they're like, I need, you're like, I need fuel. They're like, I'm sorry, we don't have fuel. When's the guy coming? Tuesday. Well, wait a minute, it's Friday. He's like, no, no, not this Tuesday, next Tuesday. Okay, and now what are you supposed to do? Okay, you're on this small little island in the middle of the ocean and you can't get fuel. So you better have a lot of liquor or something. Okay, you know, that, that could happen. In addition to that, a lot of the fuel tanks in Bimini at the fuel places, the limited amount of places where you can get fuel, have water. Water in the fuel tanks. So in turn, you're fueling your boat and you're pumping water into your fuel tank. And that's a huge problem and a very common problem. So make sure when you run over there, you bring as much fuel as you possibly can and make sure you've got extra fuel filters on the boat, an extra prop or two. It's not uncommon to spin a hub. You know, a lot of different things can happen. And remember, if you need something, you better have it on the boat. It's very, very hard to get it there. You know, it's very, very challenging to get it there. Even though you're only 50 miles away, it's not like there's a Home Depot or, or, or a Bass Pro Shops or anything like that, okay? So all your safety gear, EPER, personal locator, beacon, and I stress this, I know I'm talking a lot about safety because it's that important. 
It's that important where a small little device that costs you $250, a personal locator beacon. For the love of God, we're fishing $6,000 reels. Okay, a $6,000 reel. And you're not willing to spend $250 on a personal locator beacon that's going to help somebody find you or your family member or passenger? What are you, stupid? I mean, I'm sorry to say that, but... You know, we have to, you know, so many people are afraid to spend money or hesitant to spend money on safety gear that you'll likely never use, okay? I'm the opposite. I say invest it all in safety gear and hope to God you never use it. But if you do, what price would you pay if you were floating around the ocean and you didn't have any safety gear and somebody said, I got a life jacket, I got a life jacket. You know, what would you pay for that life jacket? Priceless, right? So don't take safety, you know, make sure you take it very, very seriously. So, okay, we're all geared up to go. We're ready to head over. As far as the boat's ready, all of the safety gear, we're bringing all of the fuel that we can carry. We've got our coolers filled with ice because that's another problem in Bimini, okay, is ice. Sometimes you can't get ice in Bimini. And guess how much ice costs if you can get ice, okay? It's about 10 times as much as it is here, okay? Really, it's ridiculous how much they'll charge you for frozen water, okay? That's all it is. But supply and demand, I don't know, they kind of got you. You know what I'm saying? You're over there. So bring big coolers with ice and not those plastic Coleman coolers, okay? Because they don't hold ice. By the time you get to Bimini, your ice will be melted. Okay, so invest in some good quality coolers. I'm sure Marshall will give you a great deal on some good coolers. The next thing you need is some paperwork. You need some customs and immigration forms when you head over to the islands because you have to check in with customs and immigration. You can get these forms online right here. Just Google Bahamas customs and immigration forms and all of the forms that you need, most of them at least, you can print right out. There's it's about five or six pages, and you have to list who's on the boat, their passport numbers, which, by the way, everybody heading over to the Bahamas has to have a passport, a valid passport, uh, their date of birth, if you're carrying any firearms on the boat, so on and so forth. You have to fill this all out. However, you'll notice that I've got black arrows on the top and on the bottom. And you know why that is? That's because if you print this out and you fill it all out and you go to Bimini and you go to check in with Customs and Immigration, you're going to hand this to the guy and he's going to go, no, man, you got to fill it all out again. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you didn't print the bottom because you have to print it on 8.5 by 11 inch paper, okay, not on regular size paper. So don't print it on regular 14, 14 sorry, whatever it is. So see, size does matter. So you have to print it on the longer paper in order to get the bottom and the top, okay? Otherwise, they will not accept it, and you'll literally have to sit there and fill it all out again, okay? Now, keep in mind, checking in with customs and immigration can be a challenge. There have been times I've gone to Bimini Sands, and there's a guy right there in the office waiting, and it's smooth sailing in and out the door. There's other scenarios where I've gone to Resort World Bimini and you're literally waiting in a room for three hours for the guy to show up and nobody can get off the boat other than the captain. Nobody can get off the boat until you're officially checked in. The sun is blazing, it's 95 degrees, you just got to the Bahamas, you're in a center console and there's six people sitting on the boat for three hours. It's not a great way to start a trip. Because by the time you get back to the boat, they're all drunk already. Okay? So, yeah. So keep that in mind. It can be a horror show, or sometimes it can be simple. But be prepared. Keep in mind, Customs and Immigration opens at 9 a.m. So there's no sense in you getting up at 3 in the morning and saying, you know, I'm going to run over because I want to be the first guy in line, and I want to be there at 7 when the sun comes up. You can be the first guy in line, but you're going to wait. Okay, you're going to wait. There have been other times in Bimini where I've gone and I've had to go to the airport to check in at the airport because there was no customs and immigration officers. And I see people shaking their heads. That must have happened to them as well. And once you arrive in Bimini, they're going to give you additional forms that must be filled out, but they're originals. You cannot fill them out here and bring them there. You have to fill out those, I forget what number form it's, it is, the card, exactly. Can I give you a tidbit? 
you can give 120 people a tidbit. You guys can go to Fort Lauderdale to the Bahamian Touristry Office. In plantation. Okay. So his tidbit, which is an excellent point, is you can go to the Bahamas Customs and Immig or the Bahamas Tourist Office in Plantation, and they'll give you all of the original forms. So when you get there, uh, obviously you can that'll speed up the process. Okay. Somebody told me there was an app coming out to go over there now for their their app, you know, not ours, but it's it's, it's well, not well, in, it, in place yet. Correct. The app is not currently in place, and right now it's still paperwork. There's also a fee that's associated with checking in. For boats 35 foot and larger, it's a $300 fee, okay? For boats 35 foot and smaller, obviously, it's $150, I think, okay? But 35 or over is a $300 fee, and that covers four anglers. If you have additional anglers on the boat, there's an additional fee for each of those anglers. It was minimal. I think it's 20 bucks per person, yeah. Okay, uh, but be prepared with cash yes. to pay that fee. And understand that that will provide you a fishing license and a cruising permit, which is valid for 90 days, you can use it again. So the next time you go within a 90 day period, you don't have to pay, okay? But if it's after 90 days, you have to pay again. But you do have to check in again. But you, oh, you absolutely have to check in again, no question. So remember that, and that's an excellent point. Don't think that within that 90-day period you can go back and check in, or I should say go back and just start fishing without checking in because you can't. Understand as you are approaching Bimini and you are approaching the islands, you must fly a quarantine flag. That is a yellow flag, okay? That means that you have not checked in. I also want to point out that you cannot arrive in Bimini with fish in your boat, okay? So, if you are traveling over to the Bahamas and you come across a pallet and it's loaded with a bunch of dolphin, okay? And they're all swimming around going, catch me, catch me, catch me! And they're all 30 to 40 pounds, okay? And they're willing to just throw themselves in the boat by law, I'm just sharing what the law yeah. is, okay? By law, you cannot arrive in Bimini with fish in your boat. Ask me how many times I've seen a customs officer check your boat, okay? Now, if you were to do that, and you were to maybe cut off any lures or hooks and hose the boat off so everything looks spotless, I don't know. I could see how people might do that. If you show up and the boat is all bloody and there's lures and baits on the hook and the guy sees that, I don't know, he may check your boat, right? So I've heard, you know, people doing both. You know, so again, but by law, you can't do that. Remember that you, when you are in the Bahamas, you can also only fish with six lines at one time. This does not apply to deep dropping unless you want to deep drop with six rods at one time. And of course, nobody does that. Okay, but you cannot fish with more than six lines. You can have as many rods as you want on the boat. You could have 30 rods on the boat. When I go over there, I've got 50 rods on the boat, it seems like. But you can only fish with six at a time. Okay? Regulations. Anybody know the regulations on bottom fish in the Bahamas, what the current rules and regulations are? You are allowed 20 fish or 60 pounds, whichever is the lesser. I'm not sure I understand what that means. I gotta be honest. 20 fish or 60 pounds, whichever is the lesser. What I do know is you are allowed to have 20 bottom fish in your boat at any given time. Okay, 20 bottom fish. Each of those fish much, must be a minimum of, anybody know? Minimum size, three pounds. Three pounds. You are not allowed to keep a bottom fish that is under three pounds. So if you have 20 fish, times three pounds at a minimum, there's your 60 pounds, okay? However, if I catch 19 snapper, 19 snapper, they all weigh between five and eight pounds, and then I catch a 50 pound misty grouper. What am I supposed to do? I'm trying to figure out if I'm supposed to get rid of all my other fish, if I'm supposed to let those, like what am I supposed to do? Does anybody know? Ceviche, <laughs> okay? So again, I think that you're safe keeping 20 bottom fish, 
okay, and just don't exceed that 20 bottom fish. That's what everybody strives for when they go over there, at least by law, they strive to limit out, and that's to catch those 20 bottom fish. So remember that, that if you're deep dropping there and you start catching these small little three pound yellow eyes or, or silky snappers that are like this, you got to be careful what you're keeping because as you continue to fish and your catch continues to get bigger and bigger, hopefully, you know, you may end up having to give some fish away or eat some fish and you're certainly entitled to give fish away. You're certainly entitled to eat fish while you're in the Bahamas. When you are coming home and transiting back to the United States, back to Florida, those fish must remain whole or you can fillet them. But if you do fillet them, there has to be the skin left on the fillet, okay? So they can identify what species of fish that is. Most guys bring fish back whole, right? Don't we do that? We take, because we all want to, we all want this, take my picture. Right? We all want this. You don't want to hold up a fillet, right? You know, you don't want to do that. You want to be like, look what I caught in the Bahamas. Woo! Look at me, right? That's what you want. Next to the boat, but you know, that's what you want, not a fillet. So everybody tends to bring back whole fish, not the fillets. So we head over to Bimini. Again, one more time by show of hands, who has been to Bimini? Everybody. Okay. Almost everybody. Who hasn't been to Bimini? Okay. So, still a lot of people. So, real quick here, when you arrive in Bimini, you have North Bimini and you have South Bimini. I just want to talk about this real quick and then we'll get into the fishing part. Do not expect to see a major inlet like Hillsborough Inlet, okay? That's not what you're going to see when you get to Bimini. You're going to see a couple of yellow range markers if you're unfamiliar with how to approach Bimini to get in there safely because there is some shallow spots. However, understand once you go there, if you're not sure how to enter the channel, just stop the boat and wait for someone else to do it and follow him in. And once you do it one time, one time, you'll be an expert. Okay, it is not complicated by any means. It's very, very easy, but you have to do it the right way. You have to approach the channel from the correct angle. But again, it's very easy. You can come right into a, a small little inlet that leads you into Bimini Sands, which is a very popular resort and marina on South Bimini, okay? You literally just go straight in. You almost can't mess it up, okay? Um, very easy to access, really, really nice. I like Bimini Sands, one of my favorite places in the Bahamas. It's casual, everybody comes out at night and shares fish stories and everybody sits down at the dock and you know, drinks and barbecues and talks about how their day was. Really cool little place, nice well-appointed rooms that range from one, two bedrooms all the way on up to, you know, I think they have some three bedroom units and stuff. They've got a pool on the premises, cool place. You go up into North Bimini, okay, and instead of going directly east into South Bimini, you're now going to be going north up the channel and understand the channel inside North Bimini is extremely well marked, okay, very, very well marked. And you're going to know if you're not in the channel because there's the bottom and there's the bottom. And you can see the bottom because the water is crystal clear over there. It's not like here. Okay, it's literally crystal clear. So you're gonna know if you're in the channel. And like I said, it's very well marked. You can go up to Resort World Bimini, which is fancy schmancy, okay? Not my kind of place, I've stayed there. However, I was a little bit shocked when one night at around 11 o'clock, my wife wanted a cup of coffee. We sat down, she ordered coffee. The lady looked at me and said, that'll be $24. <laughs> and I went, how much? And she said, $24. And I said, you're kidding me, right? Like, this is a joke, right? I thought I was like literally on candy camera or something. No, a coffee was $24. So not my kind of place. If that's your kind of place, have a good time. Resort World Bimini, okay? It's a Hilton, okay? It's a cool place. There's a pool upstairs, you know, all of that kind of good stuff. But it's a little, a little too fluffy. <laughs> There's also Big Game, Bimini Big Game, which is very popular, has been, you know, a staple in the Bimini 
fishing arena and world for many, many years. Uh, that's in North Bimini. And there's some other smaller places as well. Um, but I like Bimini Sands. There's also an opportunity to rent complete bungalows, like little houses um, that are with a slip right in the backyard. And that's up on the northern side of North Bimini by Resort World Bimini. Okay, they're almost like the Airbnb kind of things where you can rent a whole unit. So a lot of different options, okay? When it comes to the fishing, when it comes to deep dropping off of Bimini, the, the opportunities are endless. The problem is not where, you know, the problem is not can I find a place to deep drop? There's so much ledge, there's so many drop-offs and so many sloping, you know, plateaus. It, it's crazy. I'm not saying they're all holding fish. Make no mistake, this is not fishing in a barrel. That's not what deep dropping in Bimini is, and he'll attest to that right yeah. here. Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, so will he. But I'm saying that the spots are endless. They really, really are. And you have to understand that there's really what I like to say like three different venues. You're either gonna deep drop on the shallow side, shallow meaning three to 500 feet, or you're gonna deep drop mid-depth, 600 to 900 feet, or you're gonna fish deep, 1,000 to 1,200 feet. However, understand there's also ultra deep dropping, okay? How about 2,600 feet? 2,600 feet for wreckfish. Now, if you got the, the, the mm, to do that, okay? You know, that, that takes some skill and takes some specialized tackle. Very few guys are fishing that deep. Uh, we fished some spots that were 1,600 feet, okay, that were pretty impressive as well. So keep in mind, though, like I said, the vast majority are in that shallow, mid, or deep, the three to 500, you know, six to 900 range, and then, of course, the 1,000 to 1,200 feet. The deeper you go, the bigger the fish, right? The, the, you tend to think the deeper you go, the bigger the fish. Plus, the deeper you go, the less pressure there is, because not everybody's fishing those really deep spots. It requires more lead, heavier gear, and, excuse me, and more patience, because not every time are you gonna drop down and get a bite. However, you go fish those three to 500 foot spots, and I'm gonna tell you that almost every single time you drop that rig, you're gonna get a bite. Okay, your, your little rod tip's gonna go, you're gonna be like, woo, okay, and you're gonna get bites. So if you're looking for action, that three to 500 foot is where you're gonna find it, 400 to 500. As soon as you come out of Bimini, as soon as you come out of Bimini Sands, if you were to look at your chart plotter, or I'm sorry, your sounder, or even your chart plotter, there's a straight wall right there right outside of Bimini, where literally you can stop the boat in 500 feet of water. And within, by the time the rig hits the bottom, oh shoot, I'm in 200 feet. Okay, depending on what direction you're moving with the wind and the current. And oftentimes, you can't even present your bait properly because you're just moving so fast. Because remember, you're still in the Gulf Stream. You know, Bimini is the islands in the stream. Thank you. Boy, where did you guys get water? Your daughter told me. Where did she get water? So. She <laughs> God, I love this guy. He's so fast, right? It's amazing. Anyhow, so there's a steep drop off right there. As soon as you come out of Bimini, as soon as you come out of the cut right out front of Bimini Sands, you can look right at your sounder, you can look right at a chart plotter, and you'll see that there's a very sharp drop off and it's just a little bit south too. If you go a little bit south of the entrance to Bimini, you'll find that ledge. It's an absolutely awesome ledge. You'll catch blackfin snapper there, which again are called the ham bones. You'll catch a variety of different snappers there. Don't expect queen snapper there, but if you're looking for action, you'll find it there. Now understand when we're fishing that shallower side, you know, we're going to talk about the Lingren Pittman S1200, the Mac Daddy of all deep drop reels, right? Okay, if you're unfamiliar with that tow truck, I'm about to introduce it to you. 
Okay? But that's not what we're using when we're fishing for those smaller snappers. You know, we're trying to keep this as sporty as possible. So we're just basically fishing a glorified snapper grouper rod. It's an eight foot rod, okay? Rated for 20 to 40 pound line. It's extremely light and it's matched to a Daiwa Tanacom 750. It's an extremely light reel, okay? And we fish it under our arm. This is not fishing out of a rod holder. It's incredibly sensitive, incredibly light. It is manual, so I can turn the handle manually if I wanted to, although the retrieve ratio is like one to one. So don't turn the handle manually. It's variable speed. You can go faster or slower. It's got a pretty smooth drag system, certainly smooth enough. Plenty of line capacity. And understand that on this lighter outfit, and there are three outfits that we're gonna be talking about, but on this lighter outfit, I've got the reel loaded with 30 pound braid, 30 pound. That's all that you need. You know, so I see so many guys are fishing tackle that's too heavy. It's too heavy, you know, and I stress this at all of my seminars, go lighter. The lighter you go, the more sensitive it is. But it also becomes more important that every connection is tied properly. Anybody ever lose a fish to a bad knot? Anybody ever lose a fish to a bad knot? Yes. Thank you, okay? And if you're not saying yes, you haven't fished enough, or you're fibbing. It's one or the other. We all have. Not only a bad knot, your drag was set improperly, a poor connection, one of a lot of different things. We call that angler failure or tackle failure, premature tackle failure. Happens to everybody. Okay, or you're not fishing enough. So the lighter you go, the more important it becomes that all of your connections are bulletproof. Okay, that's really, really important. So you'll notice on this particular outfit when we're targeting those snapper, the reel is loaded with 30 pound. And again, this is appropriate for that 300 to 600 foot depth. Okay, 300 to 600 foot. You've got an eight foot rod, Daiwa Tanacom 750, loaded with hundreds and hundreds of yards, a fresh 30 pound diamond braid. Okay, best braid on the business. You can pull up a, you know, a Volkswagen with this line. Braid is like liquid steel, like it doesn't break. It doesn't break, it's incredibly strong as long as it's not damaged. But remember that braid is not one string it's a combination of really thin fibers that are braided together. If some of those fibers are damaged, you've got a weak spot. And what's going to happen? Zing pow. Okay, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get tight on a fish and it's going to break right at that weak point. So make sure your line is fresh. At the end of the braid, and you'll notice up at my rod tip, I've got a diamond fishing products ball bearing snap swivel rated for 175 pounds. It is not a 3,000 pound snap swivel. I don't need a 3,000 pound snap swivel. However, it's not a 20 pound snap swivel because that's not heavy enough. So it's all about balance. Now back in the day, whenever I deep dropped, I always used to have a top shot on top of my braid. I would go from the braid to about 25 feet of monofilament or fluorocarbon and then to a swivel. You certainly can still do that, okay? However, I found no difference. To be honest with you, I haven't found a difference. I'm not losing fish, I'm not pulling the hooks on fish um, because you're fighting the fish with lighter gear, you're fighting them properly. But if you wanna fish a top shot on here, you certainly can. From there, the rig itself, the trunk line, you can see is about six feet long. Down here in my hand is the lead. This is a two pound sash weight. I'm never gonna fish more than two pounds on this rod. It's just too much. It's too much work for the reel and it's just too heavy. So this rod and reel outfit is designed for two pounds. If I cannot accomplish a proper presentation in the depth that I'm fishing with this particular outfit, I'm gonna upscale to my next size outfit with more lead. I'm not gonna take this same rod and say, let me put a four pound sinker on there, okay? And if that doesn't work, let me put an eight pound sinker on there. That's not how to do it properly. That's not how this works. So again, this particular outfit is rated for up to two pounds of lead, 32 ounces, works perfect. The main trunk line is 150 pound, Diamond Fishing Products Extra Hard Leader Material. 
150 pound, okay? Now keep in mind, even though these fish Really, the, the snappers that you're going to catch in that three to 600 range, for the most part, 98% of them are going to be three to eight pounds. Why do I need 150 pound leader material? Okay. A, the structure, absolutely, because you're fishing very sharp ledges, you're fishing rocks, the structure. Number two, the only guarantee with fishing are there are no guarantees, and you never know when that fat mama grouper is down there in 550 feet of water and decides to suck down your squid. Okay, it's gonna happen. And I don't wanna be undergunned. So you don't have to go too heavy, but make sure that you've got some beefed up tackle to handle some of the larger fish that certainly you will come across as you're deep dropping. From there, you'll notice that there are three hooks. I do not fish a ridiculous 16 hook rig. Okay, how many fish can I keep? 20, okay? How many fish am I trying to catch at one time? 20. I love this guy, all right? No, I'm actually trying to catch one fish at a time. I'm not greedy, okay? I'm trying to catch one fish at a time. However, certainly I welcome an opportunity of catching two or three, but I don't need to catch five, okay? I really don't. You know, first of all, if you're on a hot bite, you don't need to catch five at a time because you're gonna be done in four drops. And also understand, whenever we are deep dropping in Bimini or in the Bahamas, never are we deep dropping with one rod. We fish two. There's a guy up in the bow fishing and a guy in the stern fishing. Myself and usually Carlos, my co-host, um, there's two people deep dropping. So if you have two guys fishing five hook rigs and you get on a hot snapper bite, it's not gonna take very long to limit out. And while some people may bend or break the rules, when you have Florida sport fishing 39 feet long on the side of your boat, you're not breaking the rules. I'm telling you that right now. So I'm in no rush to load the box. I'd like to enjoy it. So a three hook rig seems to work perfect. Plus there's less resistance on the entire outfit. If I have a five hook rig with five baits, when this is in the water with the current, it's creating even more drag and more resistance, right? So in turn, you then have to beef up the even heavier gear. So I find that a three hook rig works perfect. You'll notice there's one rig, one hook, very close to the bottom. There's another one three or four feet off the bottom and one obviously five or six feet off the bottom. These are snappers. They swim off the bottom, okay? Don't think that your bait needs to be sitting directly on the bottom, it doesn't. I've got my hooks on this rig attached to the main trunk line with swivel sleeves. This is not a three-way swivel, it's a swivel sleeve. They sell them right up there, right by the counter. It just slides right down the line. You affix it into position, you crimp it into position, and then your branch line comes right off of it. Okay, but you can see it does not slide up or down. You'll also notice that my branch lines are approximately 12 inches long. Okay, why is that? You know how some of them, a lot of deep drop rigs, the hooks are very close to the main trunk line? I like that branch line to be at least 12 inches because this way that fish could swallow that bait without feeling the resistance of the main trunk line. But at the same token, you don't want it too long because you don't want them to tangle with each other. So 12 to 18 inches seems to be perfect. Again, the same 150 pound leader material the hook is a 5.0 VMC circle hook. I don't need a giant hook for a small snapper, for little silkies or, or black fin snapper. The 5.0 hook is perfect. Only problem with that is if you do hook a much larger queen snapper or grouper, guess what's going to happen? Straight out. Quack, quack. Okay. Not saying he's going to straighten every hook, but it will happen. So it's about, again, it's about balance. And if you do hook a big fish, when you're, you know, and you're gonna know you hooked a big fish, obviously back off on the drag, because even though your leader can withstand that fish, guess what can't? The hook, if you apply too much heat. But if I fish too big of a hook, too thick of a gauge hook, 
what's going to happen with those snappers that I'm targeting? I'm going to miss too many of them and they're not going to bite it. It's not going to be a natural presentation. Those thin wire hooks penetrate that fish's mouth really easily versus a thick wire hook, a thick gauge hook. Keep that in mind. At the top of my rig, you'll also notice I have a little Duralite, a little strobe. You know what they say, no light, no bite, okay? So I like to include a little strobe. I don't need a really big light because it's a light outfit. And guess what? Down there at three to 600 feet, there's still light. The light still penetrates. So the strobe is just a little bit of extra attraction, we'll call it. As far as bait is concerned for the snapper, what's the best bait that you can use deep dropping in the Bahamas? Somebody squid. tell me. Squid. Squid. Squid and cuda, except for cuda stinks, yes, it does. doesn't it? Yes, it does. Ugh. But anyhow, it it's a great bait, no stays, question. Stays on, the hook. stays on the hook, no question. Bonita strips, fresh bonita strips, stays on the hook. Okay. Now, I'm not telling you to do this, but somebody once told me that they caught a short snapper, small, and they filleted it, and they put some of that on the hook. Now, I'm not telling you to do that, because that would be illegal. But I've been told that that fresh bait is really a good bait. So it might be a good idea to try some of that with a legal size snapper and <laughs> along with some squid. You know, so some guys fish meat, some guys put squid, some guys put a combination. In my opinion, if I only had one deep drop bait across the board, unquestionably it would be squid. Squid stinks. Squid is easy to, to get your hands on, it's relatively affordable, and everything eats it, okay? Everything, everything eats squid, okay? It's easy for the fish to suck down. I mean, it's just a great all-around deep drop bait. However, not all squid is created equal, okay? And a lot of times you'll go to a tackle shop and the squid that you find in their bait freezer is just completely gross. It's freezer burnt, it's ugly, it's nasty, I wouldn't touch it, okay? And of course, that's gonna impact how effective it is on those snappers and groupers. These fish are hungry, but they're not stupid, okay? And if it doesn't smell right, look right, taste right, they're not gonna touch it. So spend a little bit of time and effort hand-picking the squid from your tackle shop to make sure it's as clean and as fresh as, I mean, it's obviously frozen, but make sure it's as clean and as, as fresh as it could possibly be. I'm certain that Marshall has awesome squid in that bait freezer over there. Food grade, Food grade squid. Now you're talking, okay? Food grade squid. Also understand when targeting these snappers on that shallower side, you don't need to put an entire squid on the hook, right? You don't have to put a whole squid on the hook. Cut the squid in half or in thirds or something like that, you know, depending, of course, on the size of the, of the squid. Drop the rig to the bottom. Let the sinker hit the bottom because these fish are on the bottom. They're not laying on the bottom like a flounder, but the strike zone is on the bottom. So make sure that your sinker hits the bottom. Now, keep in mind, depending on the speed of the current and the direction, you may have to do a couple of different things in order to be effective. However, however, understand that whenever you are deep dropping, I don't care what depth, don't be in such a rush, okay? In other words, get to the spot that you're gonna fish, stop the boat, okay? Put it in, you know, take it out of gear, stop the boat, and just drift. Don't even drop a bait down yet, just drift. Okay, get everything ready, get your rods ready, get your bait ready, you know, whatever. Give it five minutes, 10 minutes, and then look at your chart plotter and determine exactly what speed and what direction you're drifting in. Okay, you wanna be moving, you don't wanna be sitting still. So some current or wind or a combination of the two certainly is helpful because you wanna cover ground, right? You wanna be, make sure that you're, you're drifting across that bottom. But of course, you don't want to be drifting too fast. And oftentimes, anybody ever go to Bimini and you just can't hold bottom because you're flying at five knots? You know, absolutely, that's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. So sometimes you can drift too fast. So before you drop the bait down, 
stop and evaluate what's happening. What, which direction am I drifting in? Because if I know if I want to fish this little ledge or if I want to fish this spot, if I stop directly on top of the spot, okay, I want to fish right here, and I drop my rig down. By the time the rig hits the bottom, I'm way over there. I'm over at Bobby Boyle's bait shop. I'm doing a seminar at another bait shop over there. You know, you literally flew that fast, okay? You've got to pay attention to what you're doing and what direction the drift is going in, so this way you set up your drift when you drop your baits, so you're going to drift across all of that productive bottom, okay? There are other times when somebody may have to stay at the wheel and hold the boat into the current just to help you slow down if you're drifting too fast, okay? Literally holding the boat into the current. Another, I don't want to call it a trick, but another technique is sometimes if the drift is too fast, drop your rig to the bottom and do what? Somebody tell me? Free spool it, okay? In other words, instead of locking it up, just free spool it. Just keep enough pressure with your thumb where the reel is not backlashing, but the rig is sitting in one spot. Okay, you're literally just having it sit in one spot. And then once you drift along for a few minutes, lock it up, and oftentimes you're tight. So keep that in mind. Again, it's all going to depend on the conditions that you face, which are going to change from day to day. I bet over the next couple days the current's going to be pretty fast. <laughs> all right. So, and as I mentioned, right out front of Bimini as a starting point, just south of the cut, is a great place. North of the cut, there's right directly offshore of Resort World Bimini is another sloping edge, okay? There's a great spot. There's great spots throughout there where you can drop on that shallower side from that three to 600 foot and catch the silkies and catch the blackfin snapper, okay? There's a lot of spots, because remember, it's all sloping. Just pay attention to your sounder, pay attention to your machine. But also remember that these fish move. Where they are one day, they may not be the next day, okay? Where they are in the morning, they may not be in the afternoon, okay? So, and also, when you do catch a fish, use that as a reference and start doing some, expo you know, some exploring around that area because if there's one there, there's you know, likely more fish there as well. We talked about bait. We talked about the rod on the lighter side. Like I said, three hooks, 5.0, up to a two pound lead. But now I want to kind of up the game a little bit. You know, I'm tired of catching these smaller fish. I really want to see if I can catch some potentially bigger groupers or certainly the queen snappers, which we're going to talk about more. So now I want to fish some heavier gear in some deeper water. And I'm not doing this under my arm because I'm fishing a four pound lead. You, you want to catch it? Ready? No, go ahead. So his question is, are you seeing the fish on the machine? And the answer is absolutely. You certainly can read fish on your machine. You'll read the fuzz, you'll read the life right on the bottom. No question, okay? Remember that in deep water, if you have a dual frequency sounder, your machine, you can switch from low frequency to high frequency. In deep water, you want to be in low frequency. Okay, sometimes when you're in high frequency, you won't see the marks. You turn it to low frequency and you'll see those fish on the bottom. Do not, a lot of times also, guys will fish their sounders in auto mode. Your fish finder has an auto mode, right? Almost all of them do. That auto mode isn't the best answer when you're deep dropping. Get it out of the auto mode and turn the gain up. Okay, turn the gain up so you can read even more. Additionally, if you have a split screen feature, zoom in to the bottom. Have one side of the screen zoomed in to the bottom 25 to 50 feet and turn the gain up. And now what's being revealed on that side is a whole new world that you don't even see over here. Okay, so keep that in mind. You've got to know your equipment and you know, you've got to know how to dial it in. However, if you don't see fish, doesn't mean you're not going to catch them, okay? Doesn't mean you're not going to catch fish because sometimes the fish you catch are the ones you don't see. And remember, when you're fishing that deep water, your boat's here, sometimes your rig is not directly vertical. 
So don't think that you have to see life. In other words, when I find a spot, I'm looking for the spot. I'm not looking for the fish. If I see the fish on the spot, of course, all the better. Super exciting. But if you don't, don't hesitate dropping. You know, drop that, drop that rig down and try it there. And if you don't catch anything, then of course, move on. So on the deeper side, we step it up to a bent butt rod, okay? And keep in mind, you know, I should mention this, which I didn't earlier. If you want to be successful deep dropping in Bimini, you have to fish chaos rods, right? You know that. Everybody knows. I mean, that goes without saying. If you go over there and fish any other kind of rods, just it doesn't work. I'm telling you right now, it doesn't work. And you'll be like, Mike, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't catch anything. And I'm like, what kind of tackle were you fishing? Pen. <laughs> okay, what can I tell you? You've got to fish chaos rods. That's number one. Anyhow, it's rated for 50 to 100 pounds. Okay, shorter rod, stouter. It can handle more lead in a, with a bent butt. Okay, so obviously much more powerful than the lighter rod that we're fishing. It's matched to a Daiwa Tanacom 1000. The next size up in reel. Okay, the next size up loaded not with 30 pound braid, but with 50 pound diamond braid. Okay, 50 pound diamond braid. A ton of line capacity on here. I don't need to worry about that. A ton of line capacity. You can fish rods with roller guides. You can fish rods that have the typical turbo guides, you know, the round guides. Doesn't make a huge difference, okay? Same thing with a light. Now the rig. We're all accustomed to this. Your typical deep drop rig, right? This is what everybody uses, you know, and has been using for years. And they work, there's no question. If you don't have the correct tools, the correct crimps, the correct hooks, and the correct leader material, I suggest instead of doing it wrong, walk over there and purchase a couple pre-made rigs, okay, right off the shelf. Because they work and they're effective. And again, you know, these are five hook rigs, it's fine, it's what people do. You know, I've even seen guys, and I'm not suggesting I've ever done this, but you can take a five hook rig and attach it to another five hook rig, okay? So now, you've got a fish killing machine, right? And you got one of those in the back of the boat and one in the front of the boat. Okay, now you got 20 squid in the water, okay? So that's really meat fishing, you know, serious meat fishing. But you can, you know, well, you can't, but you can. Um, but again, if you don't have the correct materials, then I suggest you just purchase the pre-hooked, you know, the, the pre-tied rigs, okay? Because again, they do work. A lot of them have glow. So it depends on, again, the depth, but in that six to 900 foot, anywhere from an 8.0 to a 12.0 hook, okay? 8.0 to 12.0. Most, the problem with these rigs that I find, these pre-tied rigs, they've got these mustad, super thick gauge, silver hooks on here that we're all like accustomed to seeing. And I don't know if this is a mustad, there's nothing to matter with mustad, I'm just saying that it's often a mustad hook. I just don't like these hooks. They're, the gauge is too thick. Okay, they're, they are strong, but you tend to miss a lot of fish because they'll grab a bait, but you won't hook them with this hook. So if you can find these rigs, which there are, I'm not sure if Marshall has them, but certainly there are rigs for sale that are just like this, that are pre-tied, but they're made with the thin wire 90 VMC hooks, I would highly suggest those. They're much more effective, and I'm telling you, Something as small as a hook, as the gauge of the hook, can make a huge difference in your success ratio. And you may, I'm telling you, it, it, it's in the details. It's in the details. Something like your leader material. Sometimes those queen snapper are really, really line shy. And you wonder, how can you be line shy? It's 1,200 feet of water. What's the difference if I'm fishing a 300 pound rig or a 220 pound rig or a 150 pound rig? It makes a difference. It makes a difference. And the lighter you go, 
the more successful you're going to be. Okay. Now on the deeper stuff, the mid-range stuff that we're talking about, you're not fishing those slopes, okay? Because now you're starting to fish humps. You're starting to fish humps and depressions that are in deeper water from six to 900 feet. Keep in mind though, off of Bimini, 900 feet is about from here to that Ford Raptor parked right there. Obviously not that close, but pretty darn close. Okay, it's right there. Okay, it, the, it gets incredibly deep, incredibly fast. So you're not going far offshore to get into deep water. Your biggest challenge is, am I going north or am I going south? For, you're gonna be far more effective getting away from Bimini. Because what happens right there? Everybody's fishing right out front. Why? Because we just crossed 55 miles of open ocean to go to an island in the middle of the Gulf Stream. And now we want to go fishing. That's why we crossed there. But we don't want to run 10 miles. We want to fish right there. Makes no sense to me, but that's what happens. Okay? And the bulk of every, and everybody that's been to Bimini knows I'm right. Am I right? Come on, you know I'm right. Everybody fishes right out front. It's the guys that are successful or the guys that get away from Bimini. Go south to gun. Okay, or cat, okay, or go north all the way up around the corner to the hens and chickens. Okay, get away from right out front. And the further you get away from Bimini, the less pressure those fish see, and you're going to end up catching more fish and bigger fish. On many chart plotters, you will be able to pinpoint, especially today's chart plotters that include 3D. Okay, you can pinpoint sloping edges and depressions and hills and differences in bottom contour right on the machine long before you ever get to Bimini or to any of the islands. I sit at my dock and I fly, I virtually fly around the screen and go, oh, look at that drop off, boom, and put a waypoint right there. Now when I get over to the islands, I'm not looking for spots because you get over there do you want to be in search mode or do you want to be in fish mode? Okay, we all want to be in fish mode, right? Do your homework in advance. There's also charts. There's a lot of charts. There are actual deep drop charts. There's Bahamas deep drop charts. I'm not saying that every one of those numbers is going to produce monster queen snapper, but you know what? It's a damn good place to start. Okay, it's better than going over there and fishing blindly. And I can tell you also, I see on all these forums, guys will go, hey, I'm going over to the Bahamas and I want to go deep dropping. Can you give me some numbers? Anybody that gives you numbers is not giving you good numbers. <laughs> he's not giving you his numbers. Okay, he's not. You might think he's giving you his numbers. He's giving you numbers that he hasn't caught anything on. Okay, or anything lately. Because he wants to know if fish have moved back there so you can tell him. Oh, dude, your numbers were great. He's like, yes. Okay, that's all he's doing. Okay, nobody gives away their great deep drop numbers. They're like highly guarded secrets. They really are. Yes, uh, did you catch anything there? No. <laughs> you must have not been fishing the right way. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, so again, you've got to put in the time. That's the thing about deep dropping is you really have to put in the time and the energy to be successful and then but there are resources. There are. There are resources that are out there and not every spot is going to hold fish. So this is why we bring different tackle because sometimes they'll bite on the shallower side. Sometimes you won't catch them on the shallower side. You got to push out to deeper water. Sometimes you got to push out to ultra deep water. And if you're not ready to tackle all of those environments, you're limiting yourself. Okay. And really at the end of the day, what do you care if you achieve, if you've got 20 big snappers in a boat that you caught in 550 feet of water, or if you have 20 big snapper in the boat that you caught in 950 feet of water, does it make a difference to you where you caught them? Nope, as long as you caught them. So in order to do so, you've got to be properly prepared. And on that subject, I want to mention that whenever you're heading over to the Bahamas, when, we mentioned, when I mentioned earlier, make sure to bring everything you need for your boat as far as extra filters, you know, and stuff, safety equipment, fishing tackle as well. Okay, if you're going to go over there with one deep drop rig and one lead, <laughs> don't go to the Bahamas 
with one rig. <laughs> All right, I'm going to tell you right now. Prepare to lose tackle. Prepare to lose tackle. It's going to happen. Okay? It happens to the best of us. I don't care who you are. You're going to get hung in the bottom. You're going to get tangled. You're going to, you know, a million different things can happen. We just went over there to film a show, West End, got our butts kicked running 80 miles, okay? 80 miles in a rough ocean, got there. The next morning, decide we're going to go fish a set of deep drop numbers that are 50 miles away. Got our butt kicked for another 50 miles. As soon as we get there on the very first drop, Carlos looks at me and says, I broke the rod. <laughs> I, what? Huh? And I look over and the top 12 inches of the rod is gone. Accidents happen, things happen. I don't know how it happened, but it happened. Thankfully, we had another chaos rod and we were able to, you know, achieve success. But you've got to be well prepared. Okay, expect the unexpected. And by the way, that was just one of many mishaps on that trip, okay, <laughs> that I don't even want to talk about. I'm just glad that's behind me. Um, so just expect the unexpected. Make sure you have plenty of rigs. Another thing I want to mention that I, I forgot to mention earlier that's really important. These electric reels, they're powered, not the Linger and Pittman, I mean, of course, that's powered by a power cord as well. But these Daiwa Tanacom reels have an external power cord, okay, that comes with the reel. It's just a little black cord. It plugs into the back of the reel. And on this side of the cord are alligator clips. You don't see alligator clips because, obviously, I cut those cheap things off, okay, because they are cheap. And they will rust out in one day after one trip and... If you think you're going to connect those rusty alligator clips, the battery terminals, and your reel is going to operate properly, you're sadly mistaken. It's not. Okay, it's not going to operate properly. So do yourself a favor and upgrade it a bit. Make sure if you're serious about deep dropping, your boat's got to be serious about deep dropping. You've got to have some 12 volt Hubble outlets. Okay, do it the right way. Okay, cut off those alligator clips. Put on the plugs, they're like 40, 50 bucks a pop, and you know what, you may think that's expensive. However, it's less expensive than running 55 miles, okay, to the Bahamas. And then getting out there on these awesome numbers and going to deep drop, your reel turns on. It does, it turns on. The little screen turns on and you're like, nice. You drop the rig to the bottom, you get bit, now you put some tension on the reel. So, you know, because you've got weight. And the reel goes, wah, wah, and just stops working. Okay, because you don't have a good connection because of rusty alligator clips or too thin of a gauge wire from the battery to the plug. You've got to make sure that it's done right and safely because you're talking about electricity, you know. So do it the right way. Don't skimp on this. You know, you know what I say? Cheap is cheap. You know what I'm saying? Cheap is cheap. Don't try and get away with doing stuff the cheap way because you're going to pay for it. And really... Cheap is expensive. That's probably the better way to say it. Going cheap is expensive. Okay? Spend the money up front, do it the right way, and you're going to have an all-around better experience. Okay? Also, you can take these cords and extend them, so this way you've got a little bit more maneuverability around the boat. But I can't stress enough how important it is that everything be done properly. Also, do not go to Bimini with one power cord. <laughs> I don't care how it's rigged. Do not go to Bimini with one power cord because when this plugs into the reel, it plugs in at like a 90 degree angle. I don't know why they designed a plug like that, but they did. It, it should be on the side of the reel, but I'm not the guy in Asia that designed it. And what happens, it, you, it ends up bending and over time, the wires in there wear out and this fails. Did that ever happen to anybody where one of these cables fell? Okay. It, here, I should give you an extra one right now because I'm telling you it will. Okay, it will. So it's real important that your boat be ready for it. Also, make sure you have at least one rod holder with a backing plate, okay, because on this lighter stuff, it's not that big of a deal. But when we go and we start fishing that ultra deep water, you know, from 1,000 to 1,200 feet of water, and you're fishing with the Mac Daddy, okay, the, the, you know, a reel that weighs as much as that little kid right there. 
Okay? You put that in a rod holder and you get hung up in the bottom. And you get hung up in the bottom. There's so much pressure being put on this rod that if you own, I'm not going to say any names of boats, <coughs> Dusky, uh, you know, and you don't have a backing plate on a rod holder, and that is in one of those rods, or, or a twin V. You know, point I'm making is not about the brand of the boat, but there's a lot of boats out there that don't have a liner. You understand what I'm saying? They don't have, you know, it's just a, a cap on the boat. There's not even anything beyond, be, behind the rod holder. There's three screws holding it on. That's it. And literally, you can grab the side of the boat and shake it. Imagine sitting this in there, okay, and getting hung up in the bottom you're literally going to rip your boat apart. I'm not kidding. You're going to rip your boat apart, or this is going to go flying off the boat. And this is not cheap. You know, I don't know what they sell them here for, but the reel itself is about $5,000. All right, so it's a, it's a serious piece of fishing equipment. However, understand that when you are fishing that deep water, when you're fishing 900, 1,000, 1,200, 1,600 feet, you've got to use the Lingren Pittman S1200. Don't try and get away with cheaper deep drop reels. They're gonna fail. I'm telling you, they're gonna fail. I've tried them, I've tried them all. There's some other ones out there, you know, crystals, um, hooker electric reels. There are some other options out there, but day in and day out, nothing is as reliable as that LP. And anybody that's, you know, a serious sword fisherman or a serious deep drop fisherman can attest to that. Okay, so again, you've got to spend the money. It's on a heavy duty bent butt rod rated for up to a 130 pound line. What line is on my reel? I fish 30, I fish 50, 80. 80. Okay, so it's loaded with thousands of yards of 80 pound braid for that deep water and much heavier gear. You know, a, a larger rig and a much heavier weight. Mike, on that. Mike, explain, explain just for some of the folks what a backing plate is. So, a backing plate, as I mentioned, when you have a rod holder on a boat and there are three screws that are holding it in place, literally like three sheet metal screws practically. That's not the proper way to do it. A backing plate is on the bottom side. There's literally a metal plate, and there are now bolts that are going from the top that extend through that bottom plate that are bolted on. So it's literally affixed to your boat, okay? And, it, and it's a much more substantial rod holder. And keep in mind, many of them, I don't want to say many of them, but you can get a rod holder that Hang on one second, got a tangle with my deep drop rigs. That ever happen to anybody? Okay. Yeah. So you can also get a rod holder that swivels. And we have that on board our 39 CB because when you're deep dropping, being able to swivel that rod is a big advantage. It makes it much easier, especially with the LP. Why? Because remember that the rod is going out like this. So now when I have fish or I want to you know, change the bait or check the rig or move to another spot, all I got to do is just swivel the rod in and grab the rig. You understand what I'm saying? Whereas otherwise you'd have to lift that giant rod and reel up and maneuver it around and it can be uncomfortable, a little bit dangerous in a rough ocean as well. A lot of things can go wrong. So that swivel mount rod holder with the backing plate is the ideal scenario. When we're fishing that deep water, and obviously I'm not going to hold this up off of that rod, but it's the same three hook rig, but it's beefed up tremendously. 220 pound trunk line, so instead of 150, we go up to 220 pounds, swivel up on top, and I want to point out that on all of my deep drop rigs, there's a swivel on top and there's a swivel on the bottom connecting the weight. Anybody ever see a deep drop rig where the bottom of the trunk line is just a loop and you loop it through the eye of a lead? Huge mistake. Why? Because when you're letting that rig down and when you're bringing it up, your sinker's going zzzz. It's literally spinning like a top. If you realize it or not, I promise you it's happening. And in turn, your entire rig gets tangled and is one big fat mess. 
Okay, but if you have a swivel on the bottom and a swivel on the top, it avoids that happening and you have a nice clean rig. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's got to have a swivel on the top and on the bottom. Well, not cheap swivels, no, not cheap swivels, because remember, cheap All is expensive. Right. Same thing, the swivel sleeve, same trunk line, except for a much, much heavier, beefier hook. This is a 10-0 VMC inline circle hook. I'm telling you that the thin wire hooks in the deep water with a lot of lead, because keep in mind, in this scenario, we're fishing eight to 12 pounds, okay? Eight to 12 pounds. Now, I know you're all looking at that going, what's that funny thing hanging from that lead? That's a light, okay? So we fish not only a light up on the top swivel, but a second light on the bottom lead, okay? Because now you're fishing water that's pitch black. It's extremely deep, extremely dark and cold, and sometimes adding a little bit of extra light makes a big difference. Same three hook rig, 12 to 18 inch trunk lines, everything is the same, it's just beefed up. And I'm certain that they have these exact rigs available here for you, okay? They're effective and they're clean. There's no glow, squid skirt, blah, blah, blah on it. It's a nice, clean, stealthy rig, okay? Where the only thing that the fish is gonna see is the bait. A nice fresh strip of barracuda, of vanita, of snapper, of a whole squid, a combination of the two, half a squid depending on the size of the squid. You can certainly mix up the baits and put a combination of bait on each hook or different baits on different hooks. When you're fishing those deeper areas for the queen snappers, okay, remember it's a snapper. It swims off the bottom. Sometimes bringing that rig five to 10 to 15 feet off the bottom will get you bites. When dragging the rig across the bottom will get you no bites. So keep that in mind that your rig does not have to be dragging across the bottom. Don't be afraid to move it. Lift it up, okay, crank it, well not crank it with the LP, but you know, retrieve it five feet off the bottom, drift for a minute, another five feet, drift for a minute, drop it back down, drift for a minute, in other words, move it through the water column. However, with the groupers, grouper on the other hand, prefer to a bait that's not moving as much and certainly that's not as high off the bottom. A grouper is going to hug the bottom. The snappers will swim up higher off the bottom. It is not uncommon to catch queen snappers 50 feet off the bottom. Okay, And even though you're thinking, well, that's, that's a snapper, he's not going to swim 50 feet off the bottom. Well, understand, if you're fishing 1,300 feet of water, 1,300 feet of water, 50 feet is not off the bottom. He's still right down there in the strike zone. And there are sharp ledges and you know, ridges and hills. And again, in off Bimini, I can, best advice I can give you, get away from outside the front of Bimini, go all the way up around the corner. There's some phenomenal spots up around the corner. But if you thought you know, or think that somebody's just gonna give you the exact GPS coordinates, it's not gonna happen. That's not how this works. Okay, you gotta put in the time, but they're easy to find. Teddy, you know, if your boat is capable of making a 55 mile trip across the Gulf Stream, I would have to assume it's got pretty good electronics, pretty good navigation equipment, and fish finding equipment, okay? So use that gear. Remember too, on the deeper side, as I mentioned earlier, you can lift that rig up off the bottom or you can hit the bottom and free spool it like we talked about earlier and let the rig just sit right on the bottom as you drift along and then retrieve it. Sometimes that works. Basically what I'm saying is don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to mix it up a little bit. Don't think that just dropping it down and dragging it across the bottom is the only way to deep drop. It's not. Get in there. Make it active. You know, think about those fish. Think about that rig. Think about that bait. Keep it moving. Give it a little bit of life, a little bit of action. Oftentimes, it, goodbye. Oftentimes that makes a big difference. It's my daughter. I have to say bye to her. I love, so, you. love you too. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Don't be afraid to mix it up. You know what I'm saying? Mix it up with baits, mix it up with how far off the bottom you're fishing. If you're targeting those queens, 
The queen snapper in particular are, are really like a migratory fish. You know, that's a snapper that moves around a lot. A grouper is a fish that lives under a ledge or in a hole or on a wreck. And not that you're fishing wrecks, but I'm saying in general. And he, and he takes up residency there, and that's where he's at. The snappers, on the other hand, are, will move a lot more, a lot more. So oftentimes, you really got to put in the time and effort to find them. Your drags, I want to stress this too, even on the big stuff. When you hook these big fish, even a queen snapper, and when I, you know, when I say big, five to eight pounds from a thousand feet down is a big fish, okay? He's going to fight. He's going to fight for his life. You, suddenly you're pulling him up off the bottom. Don't think he's going, okay, I'm coming. No, he's not. He's struggling and fighting. So that beginning part of the fight is all about finesse. Take your time. Take your time. You went all of that way over there to the Bahamas. You know, don't think you're just whack, full speed. You know, and thinking that the rod's going to go, woo, 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 pop. That ever happen to anybody? Oh, that's happened to me. You know, I'm telling you, it happens. So slow it down. Okay, I'm telling you, you get that bite, that fish is on there. You know he's there. You're bringing it up slow. Make sure your drag is set properly. Sometimes you have to stop. Just because it's an electric reel doesn't mean it has. Doesn't mean it always has to be retrieving. In other words, you can pull that speed back and come up slow. You can stop it if you need to. You can come up fast. The groupers, the snappers, the deep water fish, they will fight till about halfway in the water column and then they'll bloat. Okay? And then what happens is they float. And they literally, so the fight will generally be the first half of the water column. And then they'll bloat and they'll float up top. If you still see an eh, 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 when you're close to the surface, it's likely a snapper versus a grouper. The groupers, once they're a few hundred feet you know, from the surface, will, like I said, will float straight up. It's not uncommon to catch blackfin tuna on the bottom in Bimini when you're deep dropping. Okay, I've talked to a couple people earlier, it's happened to me and, and it's not uncommon. So keep that in mind that there's some weird bycatch that you can expect as well. Um, but Really, at the end of the day, and I'll answer your question in a second. I'll address questions in a second. At the end of the day, successful deep dropping in Bimini, and really throughout all of the Bahamas, is not only about where you fish, but how you fish, being well prepared to cover all of those different depths in the water column, okay? And be, not being afraid to try the different depths. You know, some days it's going to work out on that shallower side, as I mentioned earlier. Other days it's not. You know, you got to put in the time. It, you know, years ago, when Ernest Hemingway fished the Bahamas, I guarantee you could go right out front of Bimini, drop a rig to the bottom in five to 800 feet of water and load up on queen, giant queen snappers. Nobody was doing it, nobody had braid, nobody had deep drop tackle, nobody was deep dropping because they were too busy catching blue marlin and giant bluefin tuna. Okay, so why in the world would they try and catch a snapper off the bottom? It was a world class fishery. Today, it's a whole different world, okay, a different world. Have you been over to Bimini on a nice weekend in the summertime? These guys go over almost every weekend. They're part of the problem, okay? <laughs> they contribute to the problem, okay? There's so many, but am I right? How many boats are there? If too many. You, too many, but when you used to go, when you were a kid, how many boats were there? Not many. None, not many, right? But today, everybody's got these go fast center consoles and every other kind of boat, and everybody runs over there, and the pressure has increased tremendously, tremendously. You're not fishing the same ocean that it was 50 years ago. Plus, development on the islands has also contributed to habitat degradation. Okay, that whole casino gig they had going on, and they've got this giant pier, the pier and then the, the big catamaran ferry thing that comes in. And I mean, it's just a different world than it used to be. It really is. So don't think you're going to go over to Bimini, drop a rig to the bottom, and fill your cooler time after time. No. It's not going to happen that way. You got to prepare properly and you have to be willing to invest the time. 
that's what's going to be required. And you have to eliminate the angler and the tackle failure from the equation in order to be successful and be prepared to fail. Because you know what, when I drop on a spot that I think is going to be successful and I don't catch anything, I don't feel like that's a failure. Now I know we're not the fish. <laughs> right? I take the silver lining. I go, well, you know what? Well, I know I'm not dropping on those numbers again. Okay, so to me, that's a win-win. You know, yeah, it sucked. Now I got to bring a rig up from 900 feet of water. But that's, that's the way to do it. There's no other way to do it other than to do it. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up with that. I appreciate it. I'm going to be up here uh, answering all of the questions that you may have. Before I address the questions, we're going to do a raffle, give away some great stuff. I really appreciate everybody attending the seminar here.